Hello, Giants fans, and welcome to a new edition of Valentine's Views on the Giants here on YouTube. Please like, share, and subscribe if you're watching us. So, uh, and, and we thank you for your support always. So, Giants fans, we're a couple of weeks out from the NFL draft. Lots going on with the Giants, rumors circulating, flying everywhere about what the Giants might do. And, and and here to help us, the man with all the answers today, the man who knows everything about everything that's going to happen in the draft, that's Emery Hone of Football Game Plan, CBS Sports, good friend of the show, good friend of Big Blue View. Em, how you doing? I'm doing fine, Ed. As always, a pleasure to be on the show, man. Hey, so, uh, so Em... What are the Giants going to do in the draft? Just just <laughs> nail it for me. Tell me what it is. We'll be out of here in about 30 seconds. What are they going to do? <laughs> Man, they're they a fantastic player, right? <laughs> they're in a unique spot, though, in all seriousness. Like, pick there you six, go. You know, pick six puts them in a situation where, yeah, we know they need a quarterback, but they're not going to reach for one at six because you're outside of the top three. Um, and could they use an elite player at receiver, at offensive line? at pass rusher, you know, at, at, you know, at corner, the answers are all yes. So mm -hmm. they're in a unique spot, but they're in a good spot in a very good class at the top. I, I had to laugh because I think it was uh, Bill Barnwell of ESPN the other day did a piece, you know, basically going through all the different teams and you know, should they trade up? Should they, should they trade down? Should they stay put? And he, and his answer for the giants was, any of the above, <laughs> you know, <laughs> any of the above dude, you know, it's, it's like, thanks a lot, Bill. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Thanks a lot. But you're right. It's, it's, it's a unique spot. I mean, my, my gut feeling is there isn't going to be a quarterback there for them out of that top four. If there is one, um, if there is one, you know, and they and they really like the guy that's there with you know maybe Drake May, maybe you know maybe JJ McCarthy, whoever it might be. If there is one, then maybe you go that way. I don't know what do you, you don't, but I don't see what I don't see with only six picks with all the needs that they've got. Um, I don't see them forcing a trade up and and giving up a whole lot of resources to do it. And you you agree with that? Yeah, because you, you you touched on it. We just listed off a bunch of needs, and you know they don't have a ton of elite level picks in terms of mm -hmm. uh, positioning. So, hell, maybe you call Chicago and say, "Hey, we'll move down from six to nine if that means we could pick up, you know, an additional second. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And so yeah. that that'll help the, the you know the cause because you still can get an elite player at at nine as opposed to six. Mm -hmm. You don't fall completely out the top 10. The scenario that I don't like in a trade down, I mean, if, if you look at the Giants, it's everybody says quarterback or wide receiver at six. And, and 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 I more or less agree with that. I think, you know, if you're if you can get that wide receiver one, you know, I think it, it I think it changes a lot of things for the Giants. The the scenario that I don't like. And I keep getting asked about this: Is Giants trade down with the Bears, with Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunze on the board, and they wind up at nine with both of those guys off the board? They lose out on both of those players, and and they wind up with with Brock Bowers, you know, and and, and yeah, I that to me that feels like a consolation prize. I don't know about you. I mean, if you can trade down, get an get another pick. And still get a Dunze, you know, I, I'm I'm good with that. There, there's there's listen, and yes, a Dunze and you know, neighbors, and I, I get uh you know Marvin Harrison Jr., who will probably be gone by then. Um, but if not, then those three obviously are you get elite talents, but man, like I don't want people to sleep on other talents like AD Mitchell, Keon Coleman, you know, those are elite guys too. And Bowers is good, but also like, okay, how often do you expect to use a tight end? And we know they need a bona fide outside guy, you mm -hmm. know, and, and not saying that you can't find good. That's why I feel like getting a, an additional second round pick would be valuable for them because 
let's say for whatever reason, right? You trade down. Ideally, you get you trade down, and no one at seven or eight um takes a receiver and you get your guy, but you picked up that second round pick. Now you have ammo if you really like a quarterback to get back into the back end of round one to take whoever you think is a, a guy that can help you right now, or you just sit pat and probably take a, a day two quarterback that has upside that you can get and develop and groom it would not without breaking the bank. Cause again, I, I do feel like this personally, Ed, where uh, we got to stop pushing quarterbacks up. You know, if you feel like you can get a piece of the puzzle and he just so happens to play quarterback, that's fine. But you want to, that's that's ideal in my opinion because you really want to quarterback proof your roster with talent around him, i.e. San Francisco, to where a guy that can come in and play and just be efficient, don't turn the ball over, and make a play or two when you need him to make it, and you can go far. I feel like that should be the approach a lot of teams take. Yeah, that that is an argument against the Giants taking a quarterback, say taking J.J. McCarthy if he was to fall to six. And, and I think the argument that you get into is that people look ahead to 2025. And they and, and the feeling at this point is that that quarterback class isn't going to be really really deep, um, and I don't well, know if that's I don't know if that's a valid way to look at it or, or not. I mean that's that's the long term aspect and 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 you know if, I suppose if you feel like JJ McCarthy would be QB one in next year's draft, then you make that move. But you know, but if you're looking at it and saying Maybe it's a free agent. Maybe there's another guy there. If you can collect the ammo, you go get a guy later. But it's it's such an interesting debate. Do you take the quarterback and then try to build, or do you build the roster and then and then you know and then try to, as you said, quarterback proof the roster and then insert that guy? It, don't it's let just people, it's kind of interesting. Don't let people lie to you about 2025, Ed. Shador Sanders is the dude. Jalen Milrow is going to take another step forward. There, there is quarterbacks in this 2025 class that what they're saying about the 2025 class, Ed, is what they said about the 2017 class, which had Watson and Mahomes in it. So don't believe people when they say next year, like Shadour Sanders, if he came out this year, Shadour Sanders would have been my QB two behind Caleb Williams. And what we saw from Milrow going from what he was in 2022 to where you're like, I don't know, bro. To what he was mm-hmm. this past season, like s- skyrocket, right? And so he would have been the Anthony Richardson in this class. So folks are being disingenuous when they talk about 2025. So that may be a good option um, if you expect the Giants to. Obviously, you don't want to say this right now and say they'll be picking in the top five next year. But you know what I'm saying? Like you kind of want to make sure let's get enough good players around whoever we're going to get at quarterback. Let's make sure the roster is good first. Mm-hmm. Um, before we reach on whoever we think the next quarterback is. So let's say let's say they stay at six. Um, no, let's just let's just say, you know, it's how do you rank those top three receivers? You know, Marvin Harrison's probably not going to be there. How do how do you look at those top three? Well, I look at it because you know I break the position down by X receiver, Z receiver, slot, and big inside receiver, right? So uh, my number one X is Roma Dunze. Uh, my number one Z is Malik Neighbors. My number one slot is Lab McConkey. Um, and so my number two Z receiver is Keon Coleman. My number three is Marvin Harrison Jr. Now my number two um X receiver is AD Mitchell, you know, of, of Texas. So it's like, okay, there's a bunch of guys that I, I would have, you know, these high value grades on. So if I'm not getting one. You know, so it's no difference from one to five for me. So whichever one goes, I I would as a team, I would still feel comfortable picking one of the top five guys, which is why I would be hesitant to leave off of six. Right. You know what I'm saying? So that's that. That would be you would not be hesitant to move off of six then. No, I I would stay at six. Put it that way. Mm -hmm. I would want to stay at six and take one of these guys that I know are elite. Because here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Because of the quality of receivers at the top and quality of tackles at the top, even though we say it's a deep tackle class and a deep receiver class, you run the risk of if you, whoever takes the first receiver, 
expect the run to happen. Whoever takes the first tackle, expect the run to happen. You don't want to be at the end of the run. You know what I'm saying? You right. want to start the run or be right next when the run starts. Um, so that's why the Giants are in such a unique spot at six. Yeah, it's interesting because I always look at it this way. People ask me, you know, what position do the Giants need? And, you know, the, the, you get the same question every year. What Do they need this, that? What do they need? And I keep looking at this roster saying, yeah, they could use depth. And and there's things they could do if they trade down. If you if you make the, make the trade down with Minnesota and get 11 and 23, you might be able to get a corner. Maybe you get an offensive lineman. Maybe you get one of those wide receivers later. Maybe you get the quarterback at 23 if that's what you want to do. But what you're giving up is a game-changing player. And for me, I keep looking at the Giants roster, and I've said it for years. They're missing enough. They're missing game-changing players. And they just let one go to Philadelphia. So you you don't have enough game changing players on this roster and this is why it's hard for me to trade down because you're staring at an opportunity to get a game changing player at number 6 and, and this is what we thought about the giants when they had the two top 10 picks um the year they took neil and Thibodeau. it's like hey man listen yeah it sounds good to move you know package and move up or you know move down trade down and collect more picks but if you got a chance to take two elite players you take it, you know what I'm saying? Now, granted, Neil is still a work in progress, but Thibodeau has been a, a, an elite player, from, in my opinion, for the Giants' defense. Um, and so you want to have a lot of these type guys, and to your point. You want elite, and the top 10 almost ensures that. If I feel like we, we've we seen a lot of football, Ed, and we know uh, when, we're, when we reference top 10, I know I'm referencing 1989 where you have – Troy Aikman, Barry Sanders, Derek Thomas, Deion Sanders, like that. That's what a top 10 looks like, right? You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And and if you're picking to pick 17, you don't get a Troy Aikman, Barry Sanders, Deion Sanders. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, which this, it, which... is, this is one of the, the things that people also don't understand or that, that people aren't willing to recognize. There's 32 picks in the first round. There aren't 32 players who are pure first round players. There's maybe Jerry Reese used to say there's maybe 15, 16 in every class. There might be 20 in a really, really good class. But what you always see in the bottom half of the first round of the draft is, oh, I thought that guy was going to go in the first round in the second round. I thought that player was going to go in the third round because once you get beyond 15 or 16 guys, it's always, you know, the beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Right. So it's it's hard for me to look at giving up the opportunity to, to get a game-changing player when you're pushing yourself back into an area where you've gone from the guys everybody, everybody feels like is going to be a top player to the guys that we argue about. I don't know how you feel about, you know, I don't know if you agree with that. No, I agree, because here's the thing, like you, that's like when people uh, with, with a number one overall pick, man, if I got a chance to take a difference maker, if I got the first pick of 10,000, which means I get to pick the best out of the 10,000 prospects in the class, right? The best, like, man, mm -hmm. you would have to give me half of the franchise for me to move off the pick because mm -hmm. how often do you get a chance to get the best of the elite? Right, mm -hmm. so top six, you're still getting an elite player. Six of ten thousand is still great. So, mm -hmm. man, it'd be hard. Like you don't, you don't want to pick in the top ten, but while you're here, man, let me take the player that's gonna push us in the direction to where we won't be picking in the top ten again. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Let me let me move off of six a little bit. Um, what do you think of the idea? of quarterback on day two quarterback on day three i don't know i don't i just don't know you know the, the hit rate on quarterbacks in in the first round is like 35 percent um you can get a guy on day two or day three but 
the hit rate on those guys is even is, is way below that number. Um, is is it worth it for a team with six picks, or as you as you talked about a little bit earlier, just just keep building the roster and then go get the guy you're in love with later on? I, I feel like the Giants did a good job of bringing in Drew Locke because that gives them luxury of not pressing for a day two quarterback, an early day two quarterback, right? Because Locke has started some games. Locke has shown in spurts he could play well. I mean, he did a good job when he played the Giants uh, this past season out here um, when he had to come in the game. Um, So that gives them some luxury. And it helps them avoid – it's like going to the grocery store on a full stomach. You are going to go in there focused on what you have on that list and what you came in there to buy – and not get swayed by, man, there's, oh, wow, look at these Oreos. Oh, wow, look at this big, delicious rotisserie chicken. Like, I'm already full. I came in here for eggs, spinach, and broccoli. I'm going to leave with eggs, spinach, and broccoli, right? Okay, Mr. Okay, Mr. Gettleman. <laughs> I, which, I, I had to throw that out there because it's a typical GM saying, but exactly the way Dave Gettleman used to put it is you don't want to shop hungry. You don't, man, because at the end of the day, you're going to go in there. And and if if I'm, listen, if I'm looking at this properly, there are options on day three that that are that are hidden options that, that could be there. Michael Pratt of Tulane would be a good day three option that has a pathway to start. Jordan Travis, fortunate, unfortunate injury for him, fortunate injury for the Giants. The fact that he still may be there on day three, you take him and you slowly work with him. You nurse him back because you like what he put on film at Florida State. Same with Michael Pratt. You like what he did at Tulane, no less. I never thought the words Tulane beats USC in Cotton Bowl will ever come out of my mouth. Right. <laughs> and, and Michael Pratt was the quarterback who led Tulane in in that, that season to knock off Caleb Williams and USC. Right. Those are those are those hidden day three options that give you that developmental player that you are not pressed to reach for that you can stash and, and work with uh, in day bowl system and then have someone that you can say, Hey man, look, we can give this dude a, a shot because we we've worked with him. We like how he's played. You saw what they did, albeit in a short sample size with Tommy DeVito, you know, here's better players at a discount rate that you didn't have to reach for. So I think that's the way they probably should go. So therefore, you can focus on your top three picks being guys that can be impact starters. It's so interesting because the Giants have so many pathways here. They they are really one of the more interesting teams in this draft. And, and I think it is because of the, the quarterback question. It's just, do they, don't they? Do they really believe in Daniel Jones? Do they really want to just support Daniel Jones? And, and and maybe the way to maybe maybe you're right. Maybe the way to do it is to is to just build the roster, support Jones, and then figure it out a year from now if it doesn't work. And if you take a day three guy, I'm not a big supporter of a day three guy at this point. But but if there's a guy that they're like, you know, you know, man, we think this guy's just a guy that should have been taken off the board earlier than this or whatever, you know, then you take that shot, but, but it's, it's just, it's so interesting what, uh, how, how this might turn out. Right. Cause Daniel Jones is going to be on the roster regardless. So you kind of, you're going to have to, you know, figure you know, it's the financial part that's going to keep him on the roster. You gave yourself some grace by bringing in another starter, um, a guy that has started an experience in drew lock. So now I think that's the easiest tell that, Hey, they brought in a free agent quarterback they know none of these top tier quarterbacks are going to fall to six. They're going either receiver or, to be honest, a corner. Wouldn't surprise me there as well. You can get an elite corner at six also. You can get the best corner in the class that you feel like is the best corner in the class to pair up with, with Tay Banks right there to help out your defense because that's the other unknown. We don't know what type of defense we're getting here that's not Wink Martindale, right? So this is an area for them to try to help out that side in addition to building receivers. So that's why I feel like the Giants do have some great options there at, at pick six. Yeah, that one that one would surprise me. Corner at six would surprise me. Corner wouldn't surprise me at all if they you know, we talked about the trade down scenario. If they're sitting eleven trading down with Minnesota, sitting thirteen trading down with with the Raiders. But 
before we move off round one, who's your top guy? Who's your who's your guy if you're if you're picking corners in this class? Terion Arnold is outstanding in my opinion. Great technician, great footwork, great ball skills, great uh, you know, coach on the field, um, great awareness. That would be the one that's scheme diverse. It doesn't matter who's coaching him, he's an elite talent. All right. Hey, let's move off of round one. Let's move off of that. And let's go to the uh, the area that that Emory Hunt really specializes in. Let's go to day two, day three guys that you look at, you know, who who you may value, you know, more than more than other draft analysts, guys that might fall into into those categories, especially let's talk about some of the positions that that the Giants really could use help. We've talked about quarterback a lot, but even even running back, even wide receiver, even corners, um, you know, defensive line guys. Shoot, I mean, it, there's so many positions. I think maybe we should just just talk about players, <laughs> right? You know, as I think about it, let's just talk about players, guys that you like more than more than the majority of draft analysts. I'm a big Jermaine Burton fan out of Alabama. Explosive receiver. Um, you know, he's good with the ball in his hands. He has that level of burst and explosiveness, and he's built the same way uh, how Odell Beckham was when he was with the Giants, right? That same 5'11", 195, explosive ball of a wax that can get down the field, right? He is someone that could be there potentially on day two if you don't want to go – or hell, if you want to double up on wide receiver, right? Um, we've seen that happen. Uh, we talked about A.D. Mitch. I'm a big fan of him. You know, Xavier Leggett, another explosive guy with the ball in his hands, probably a day two guy, you know, a catch and run threat. Uh, we've talked about that before, how the Giants have built those catch and run threats within the roster. But he gives you a physical presence that could play on the outside at 6'1", about 225. You know, so in cornerback, we talked about Terrion Arnold. We talked about uh, I'm a big Kool-Aid McKinstry guy as well from Alabama. Uh, he may go in the first, but also could be there on day two. Um, you know, if you're, you're thinking about Roe Torrance, if you're looking at a, a physical press corner out of Arizona State, he's a guy like that, too, um, that you can get on day three. You know, had a really good, you know, all-star game circuit. Um, and if you're talking about some underrated guys, like, you know, I'm all about these these uh, fly under radar backs. Uh, Isaiah Davis of South Dakota State, finisher, good footwork, good vision, good pass catcher. Uh, does all the things well that you want to see from the position could be a pace setter, um, you know, all, also could work well as a as a compliment because um, he did that early in his career. He was behind Pierre Strong um, for South Dakota State. So this is a this is a class at all positions that really can bolster your, you know, depth on the roster, because we know 90 percent of the league is rotational depth. There's. 10% of the league is stars. And we know it's a star driven league, but 10% of that is stars. Everyone else is basically in the middle and you want to make sure you're in the middle is very good. And this is a good class to make that uh, in the middle, pretty doggone solid. I want to ask you about two offensive players, Malachi Corley. Physical guy, catch and run guy. Um, some say Debo Samuel. I wouldn't go that far, but Malachi Corley is, is excellent with the ball in his hands. Um, plays bigger than his size, which is fascinating because he's 5'10", 215. And you like that arrogance that he has. Like, And once he gets the football, he's trying to break tackles. He's getting up the field. Um, and he's making things happen after the catch. And that's the type of player you, you kind of want who has that mindset. It's the physical mindset that I'm bigger than you, I'm better than you, and I can go out here and prove it. I'm a big fan of Corley. Uh, running back, I wanted to ask you about small school kid Dylan Loby from New Hampshire. I was on a broadcast for their game against uh, Mammoth, where the other small school back in Jaden Shirt and explosive back um, was phenomenal too. Lobby is someone that can catch the ball. Like they, they literally was featuring him in the passing game uh, where he could line up in the slot. He could run good routes. He gets open. He understands how to run routes versus zone. Um, anything option route, he's going to tear up the linebacker um, and he can catch well away from his body. So he's a very good receiver. Uh, everyone brings it a 300 yard game he had against central Michigan, which, you know, when, we, when you watch the reason why you understand, okay, yeah, he was, they didn't expect him to be that big of a threat as a receiver. 
But uh, you know, him and him and Jaden Sherton are two small school guys that have different skill sets. Sherton can even help you as a kickoff returner based off the new rule because you kind of want to put a running back back there, a guy that's used to carrying the ball that can make things happen with a with a blocking scheme. Um, and, and Sheridan gives you that explosiveness. Four four guy plays faster than that. Um, local kid at Monmouth, you know, five nine one seventy, um, or five seven one seventy, but definitely can make his. He could be this year this this generation's Joe Morris if you if you think about it that way from a Giants perspective. Yeah, let's let's uh, let's sidetrack a little bit here. I wanted to ask you about the new kickoff rule. Um, you like it, and how do you think it's going to affect rosters? You kind of hinted at the kind of kickoff returner that that might be used. Yeah, you kind of want somebody back there that that is used to you know running and setting up blockers. Um, in a normal kickoff setting, you wanted someone that has great acceleration and speed because just to hit really, that hole, just hit it yeah, just hit that hole, hit it and, and go. go. Yep. And for punt returners, you want someone that has more agility than speed because it's about getting out of the way it's like trying to walk down the street in new york city um and you know there's a thousand people on the sidewalk yeah. coming at you you just trying not to get hit that's yeah, it's, it, it's interesting that you said that because you know people ask me all the time well if a guy can return kickoffs why can't he return punts <laughs> they're two completely different they've always been two completely different things you know in, in traditional kickoff you catch the ball there's nobody within 40 yards of you in a in a punt return situation, you're catching the ball with all kinds of guys in your face, and, and your first job is to have enough guts to catch the ball. And your second job is your second job is to try to make guys that are close enough for you know, to to be able to breathe on you. You're trying to make those guys miss. Yeah, it, it's the it's it's legitimate chaos. Like you got to be type A crazy to return punts. You know. But you got to be a sprinter to return kicks. Now, if you have the ability to bo- do both, you're elite, you know, because mm-hmm. they, they right. require two separate skill sets. But, you know, with the new kickoff rule, I like it because it brings special teams back into play. You, it, it makes it an important part of the game. And it's not diminishing what those guys bring to the table as 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 value. So now you created more jobs for, you know, you look at that position now as a, as a legit skill position, and not a throwaway position, because here we're going to return it. We could maybe set up a different, like, you know, we could run different games up front to try to block a certain way to to pop open a, a lane. And if you got somebody that's used to reading blocks like that, um, boom. But on the other side of things, you're probably going to have a little bit more room for safeties and athletic backers, probably not a lot more D linemen that are going to be on, you know, this kickoff coverage units because you want the guys that could get down the field, number one, but number two, can make open field tackles. Because you don't want a situation like you have on on field goal, where if a kick gets blocked and a team returns it, now you out there with seven offensive line. You're like, man, we we we're screwed, you know. Mm-hmm. So you're gonna see it change a little bit, and that's gonna probably affect a lot of the draft philosophy on day three, where you're looking at at special teamers anyway. But now you're really focused on okay, how fast is this guy? Can this guy make open field tackles? Did he play on teams in college? What was his success rate on kickoff coverage? Is he a gunner? Can we use him as a gunner? So you're going to see a lot of that change, how people go about things even more so on day three. All right. Hey, quickly, um, we didn't really talk about two positions on the defensive side of the ball where I think the Giants could use some depth. Uh, Safety after losing Xavier McKinney Mm. and defensive tackle. Um, If, you know, Giants fans know the Giants traded away Leonard Williams last year. They lost a Sean Robinson in free agency. So they've lost two big, talented, good players next to Dexter Lawrence. Uh, So that's another spot where they could be, you know, day two, day three, looking for help. Uh, Just a a couple guys to, 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 uh, to keep in mind at those two spots. Listen, uh, my number one nose tackle is McKinley Jackson of Texas A&M would be outstanding to help back up Dexter Lawrence and, and give them like some good, some good oomph up front. Now, if you're looking for another Leonard Williams type, a guy that can kind of do it all. I was a big fan of uh, Brandon Dorless of Oregon. I felt like every time I watched him on film, he was just in the backfield. He could play that five technique, which Leonard Williams really played. Um, and that kind of could free up even more opportunities for both Burns and also, 
uh, Thibodeau. So I think Dorless could be a, a legitimate option early in the draft for the Giants in terms of like early day two. Uh, and then on the back end, free safety, I'm a big fan of, of Jalen Simpson out of Auburn. I think he's the best pure free safety in the class, even though I like what Pinnock, uh, Pinnock did last year for the Giants. I think adding more guys that can do more combo safeties, uh, Sean Preston out of Mississippi State is another one that really has good film that, that really could provide some value out there on the back end. Cool. Hey, Em, I appreciate the time. Always appreciate the insight. And uh, we're we're gonna have to keep doing this. So you know, maybe uh, maybe after the draft, we'll uh, we'll we'll get back together and and talk about what the Giants actually did. Uh, looking forward to it, Ed. Always a pleasure, man. All right, hey, uh, let folks know where they can find your draft guide, where they can find your work. Oh, that's right, man. I forgot I put out the largest draft guide in existence. <laughs> Footballgameplan.com slash twenty twenty four draft guide. Over 900 individual scouting reports. So it won't be just list of players. You get a scouting report on every prospect in the draft guide. It's the best value for your buck. <laughs> Footballgameplan.com slash 2024 draft guide. And if, if, I right. say this, if you have purchased a draft guide every year since 2020, right now you're sitting on over 4,300 individual scouting reports. That's insane. <laughs> Jeez, I mean, you know, why don't you get a little bit excited about it? I am. I'm amped up about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And thank you very, very much, Giants fans. Thank you, as always, for listening. Please stay safe out there. Take care of each other. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.